Welcome to our Leaders Series podcasts. Today I'm talking to Graham Innes. Graham is a lawyer, mediator and company director and was Australia's Disability Discrimination Commissioner from December 2005 to July 2014. As a human rights advocate for the past 30 years, he has played a role in many human rights and disability initiatives, including the drafting of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. In 2013, Graham won a case against Railcorp, which was found to have discriminated against blind and visually impaired passengers. He was admitted as a member of the Order of Australia in 1995 in recognition of his human rights work and his contribution to the rights of people with disability in Australia. Graham is currently the chair of the Attitude Foundation. Welcome, Graham, and thanks so much for making time to talk to us today. Always a pleasure to talk with you, Christina, and great to contribute to the Leaders Initiative. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, I'd like to just start by asking you, how did you get into disability activism and advocacy? What, what led you here? Um, I started as a student. I, um, uh, I saw a lack of services being provided by Royal, the then Royal Blind Society um, in regards to putting student material into Braille and they ranked it um, equal to material for, um, for leisure and uh, sort of vocational activities. And I took the view that students' uh, work should be um, put ahead of the queue um, because if, if students didn't have their books in Braille, um, you know, uh, when the university course was happening, it would be very hard to complete the course. So that was the first bit of advocacy that I, I got involved in and then moved on from there uh, to blindness organisations and the broader disability field. I was the first chair of uh, DPI in Australia uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, DPI? Yes, DPI. Disabled Peoples we, International. Yes, yeah, sorry, which is now, um, well, it's People with Disabilities Australia here in Australia, but it's still DPI internationally. And so what took you out of the blindness community into that broader disability community? I guess um, I, I saw a need uh, for, on certain issues, for a broader approach working across disabilities. And uh, one of them uh, really was in the area of, uh, of discrimination, where I could see that we would, uh, as a group, be a more effective lobby if we worked together. There are still... Um, issues which are very specific to people who are blind or vision impaired. Um, and I'm still involved in advocating for those issues and, and the uh, Sydney trains uh, issue was an example of that. But, um, uh, and there are issues for other people with other sorts of disabilities which are specific to them. But really there's a lot of issues which are um, where disability is irrelevant, uh, particularly uh, attitude change and discrimination. And I started to work in those areas and that took me into the broader field. Mm. And is that when you started heading towards your position as Disability Discrimination Commissioner? Well, you know, it's hard to know when you start heading towards a position like that. Uh, I, I first got involved in discrimination, uh, in the area of discrimination, uh, when working for the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Board as a conciliator. Uh, once I'd, I had my law degree, um, I was employed employed by the board to deal with complaints and that and um, being the chair of the Disability Advisory Council of Australia which was then the, the government advisory body uh, led me to helping to develop uh, the Federal Disability Discrimination Act uh, which I worked on in the early 90s um, and I suppose having had a, a hand in the development of that act uh, I was keen to have a hand in the implementation of it so one of the things that I hoped to achieve at some point in my career was to become Disability Discrimination Commissioner. Uh, and I was able to do that in, in 2005. Fantastic. And it's an interesting position, isn't it? I, I just wanted to explore that with you particularly um, because, you know, a lot of us talk about representing our community and being in those uh, positions or finding ourselves in spaces where we're speaking on behalf of our community or being asked to speak on behalf of people with disabilities. Um, how do you reconcile a position like Disability Discrimination Commissioner, which is actually an appointed position, with that representative role? Hmm. Well, I didn't ever reconcile them. So uh, I didn't ever regard my role as Disability Discrimination Commissioner as a representative role. 
Uh, I was certainly uh, a lobbyist and an advocate, uh, but I, I didn't ever uh, think that I represented the views of people with disabilities. So one of the things that I uh, continually did whilst in the role was to keep talking with the disability uh, movement with people with disabilities, uh, keep consulting uh, to make sure that what I was saying aligned to the views of people with disabilities. Um, because I don't believe that uh, a government appointed position can um, represent people with disabilities. The only true representatives of people with disabilities are those that we've chosen ourselves. Yeah, and what about when the media thinks, oh, you're the, the one person with disability because that's a prominent position in mm. Australia. Um, you know, that's the one person with disability the media can find or think of. Sure. So they come to you and, and expect you to take that representative role. Um, well, you know, you've got to walk a line between taking advantage of the opportunity that uh, media comment provides you uh, and, uh, and, and not claiming to be the representative. Uh, and I'm sure um, at one time or another in the nine or ten years I was Commissioner Christina that I, uh, that I crossed that line, um, not, not on purpose but, um, but unconsciously. And, uh, uh, and I can remember a few occasions where uh, the disability uh, field quite appropriately just pulled me back and said, well, hang on, that's, you know, what you've said is fair enough, but you can't. And so that was a, uh, that's a, a process that you're constantly thinking about in your mind because you don't want to, um, you don't want to miss an opportunity uh, to put a view which you know is the view held by people with disabilities. One of the other things that I regularly did was that I would put my view as commissioner and then I would give the journalist the, the relevant contact in the, the deafness field or the blindness field or the physical disability field and say, you know, maybe you should get a comment from them as well. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because we do end up with people who are prominent uh, disability activists, but they're not mm. necessarily um, attached to a particular organisation or particular group in the community. And it, it, it must be a difficult tension to reconcile with. I think it is. And, uh, you know, we see people like uh, Kurt Fernley and Dylan Al Alcott, uh, who are both very good um, Paralympians and also, uh, you know, Dylan building his own career in the media as well. Uh, and that's fantastic. Um, and, and they're both very aware that they're not representative of the views of people with disabilities, but they're, um, but they're put in that same uh, position by the media and by the community. Um, the people I think that we have to be more careful of and, and sort of bring back into line are those who uh, actually um, think that they are spoke, able to speak on behalf of uh, the broader disability field. And that's a privilege not given to many of us, and it's a, a privilege only given by um, by election uh, by by our peers, uh, because people who who think they can speak on behalf of um, people with disabilities, or or parents who think they can speak on behalf of their children with disabilities, uh, can be a real problem. Mm. So, what do you think is important when you're acting as a representative um, that? That understanding you talked about as, as Commissioner consulting regularly with the disability uh, community, the disability movement. Um, mm. you, what, what other things apart from that consultation is it important to, to really be on top of if you're acting in that representative space? Um, well, I think, you, you know, you've got to be uh, on top of the views of, of people with disabilities as they, um, as they move and change. Um, so you've got to have a continual uh, dialogue. Um, you have to, uh, as I said, be prepared to reference those people and those groups and, uh, uh, and, and draw them out uh, to comment in uh, particular uh, debates um, and always uh, try to have them at the table when you're negotiating with government or with industry uh, on a particular issue. And, and, and I did that a lot um, uh, when we were negotiating around captions and around uh, transport and, and access to premises standards. Uh, I was very strong on making sure that people with disabilities, uh, the representatives of people with disabilities, were always at, at the table. Um, you can, though, play another role, and, and I did do this um, in certain circumstances, where I, I would, um, I mean, I'd have a public role of conducting uh, or participating in those sorts of consultations. But I could also play an informal role of, uh, of going to government and saying, hey, as you're framing this policy, you need to take the views of people with disabilities into consideration 
and these are the people who you should talk to and these are the views that, uh, that have been expressed. So being a government appointee um, gave me the opportunity to be that little bit closer to government. And um, commissioners at the Human Rights Commission have to be very careful that we don't just become one of the many voices or as advocates, but we, we play that slightly separate role um, because it gives us a lot of advantages in terms of the development uh, of policy and the input uh, from the disability field. Is that a bit like, you know, some of us talk about the power of being in the room. And I guess what we were just talking about with both Dylan and Kurt was understanding the opportunity to use an opportunity when it turns up. Is that mm. a similar type of thing? There you are, you're in the room. You're actually one of the few people with disabilities who's in a position of influence and using that, making sure that you don't let that opportunity go to waste. Uh, I think that's right. And Kurt Fernley's comments at the Commonwealth Games were so powerful um, because he uh, was involved in celebrating his success at the Games, uh, but then chose to point out that uh, you know, he was, uh, he was one of the privileged in the disability space. And he talked about how many people uh, with disabilities don't have a job and uh, that 45% of us live in or near uh, poverty and used his place in the room, if I can uh, use your phrase, uh, to, to advocate in that way. And I thought very effectively um, reached back to give a hand up to many uh, thousands of other Australians with, uh, with disabilities and really put that uh, issue on the agenda. Mm. Yeah, and another place where you've been in the room and, and been able to wield some influence is at the United Nations, which you've participated in on a number of occasions. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did you work with that representative role and also that power of being in the room in a forum like that? Well, again, one of the first things that I did, I was part of the Australian delegation uh, that went to the first UN meeting to... Uh, decide whether or not uh, there should be a convention de developed. And um, many people aren't aware that uh, the Australian government's initial position was that we didn't need a disability convention. And um, so I, as part of the Australian delegation, had to represent that view of uh, government um, in the first meeting, but then, then came back and in conjunction with the peak disability organisations jointly lobbied to change that uh, government view. And Philip Ruddock was the Attorney General then uh, at that time when, when, and he did change the government view. So that the next time we went, we uh, were advocating uh, in support of a disability convention. Uh, the other thing that I worked hard to do was to ensure that there was always strong representation from the peak disability organisations. Um, and for the first time, uh, NGOs, non-government organisations were uh, allowed in, into the room and into the debate. Uh, in the UN, and I worked quite closely uh, with the Australian NGOs who um, who played an important role in um, ensuring that the convention is the strong document that it is. Mm. So just going back there, when you when you were first, you said that first um, uh, visit, that first delegation, when you were on the Australian delegation, so you're representing the Australian government, uh, or the Australian people, I guess. Um, and so the importance is to actually be aware of the government policy, and that is what you are beholden to, you must mm. represent. Um, that must have been an interesting position to find yourself in. Well, it was. But again, you know, there's benefits in being in the room because uh, we, had to, um, we had to report back each day uh, to the Australian government on the conversations, and we were able to frame our reports um, in a way which I think helped to um, narrow the Australian view and um, perhaps I should put it this way, um, ensure that the Australian opposition did as little harm as, as possible without actually going outside our brief of, um, of, of opposing the development of a convention. So we were able to relay back to government, look, the, you know, the vast majority uh, view here is in support of a, of a convention. We may be doing uh, Australia's reputation damage by pushing these points too strongly. And we were able to make all of those points um, back to government. Government didn't change its mind while uh, that first meeting was going on. Um, we, we came back and government changes its, changed its mind after that meeting. 
And how did you find that using the UN process? You know, it's a, it's a strange place. It's, it's in some <laughs> ways very formal, but in other ways not. And, and there really aren't huge numbers of people with disabilities around, you know. So no. how was all of that? It's a fascinating process. I describe it as 99% uh, uh, boring and 1% interesting, but you've got to be paying attention 100% of the time, otherwise you miss the interesting bits. Um, there's a lot of formal presentations, uh, much of which don't amount to a lot, but in the background, there's all of this informal lobbying and interaction that's going on uh, whilst countries uh, share their, their, the positions of their governments and try to, uh, to find consensus or uniform positions. And I found all of that as a, as a mediator and a, a conciliator and a negotiator, I found all of that absolutely fascinating. Now, um, there probably aren't too many others. I can think of half a dozen or 10 others in the disability field who are um, as nerdish as I am about UN negotiations, but there aren't many of us. Uh, but for those of us who are UN nerds, uh, we found the, fa the process very fascinating. But most people would probably think, my God, it takes a very long time to, to get very little done. But it's a bit like a duck, uh, Christina. You know, under the water, there's a heck of a lot going on. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm just excited to hear there's another nerd on the planet. I thought I might be the only one. <laughs> oh, no. No. no I, I'm sure there's about eight or ten of us in Australia who are definitely nerds in that respect. But uh, And I'd rank you among them. <laughs> How thrilling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's a it's a weird place, and I think um, one of the things that I've been most um, on a personal basis I've been quite interested in is using those mainstream forums. So, in some ways, this was the first time that disability had become its own thing at the UN. Oh, absolutely, and uh, and that was really exciting to be around that. And and disability drove the agenda in some quite different ways. Uh, it was also the first time that NGOs were allowed in the room and and actually allowed to participate in the debate. Um, at prior um, negotiations, NGOs had sort of had to sit at the back and, you know, they were given 10 minutes to speak at the end of the conversation if they were, if they were lucky. Um, but that's not how it worked for this convention. <clears throat> and disability was also the fastest convention, um, uh, the fastest international instrument ever negotiated. So uh, disability uh, set some new directions and some new records. Um, and interestingly, what happened in the UN in the uh, uh, late 90s and into the early 2000s sort of happened in Australia uh, a bit later on uh, as the process of the National Disability Insurance Scheme uh, developed. Because one of the things that the, um, that the lobbying around the NDIS did was, was move disability to the centre of the conversation in Australia where it had never really been before. Mm. Do you think that's where... Um moments of pivot you know there's an opportunity there for political power to be seized and you know hopefully to build on something absolutely i'm, I'm a great believer in that and um and windows arise whether it's in a, a broader disability context uh, such as the ndis or uh, in any negotiation there are windows of opportunity and you have to be always open to those windows and, and always ready to take them. And negotiation is a slow incremental um, process. It rarely jumps forward in, in leaps and bounds. Um, but I can think of times uh, where, where it has done that, both in the broader disability context and, in, and on particular um, issues. Um, I, I remember um, when the DDA was being um, uh, developed and it was in Parliament, uh, the Keating government was uh, was putting it through prior to the uh, 1993 uh, election, and there were a couple of instances in the Senate where the bill could have fallen. There was some um, Telstra were um, were lobbying for a complete exemption uh, from the DDA, and uh, there was just a moment of opportunity where conversations took place uh, with myself and, and other lobbyists with relevant ministers, where ministers took the bit between their teeth and said, no, we're just going to go forward with this. And uh, I can think of uh, half a dozen of those uh, around the DDA, and there's been many of them in, in many of the other negotiations in which I've been involved around um, transport standards and access to premises standards. And when those windows occur, you have to be all, always waiting and ready to jump through them. It's sounding to me there like you're, you're suggesting that there's, you know, again, it's that power of being in the room, but also of 
knowing how to use an opportunity when it turns up right in front of you. Yeah, reading the game. And uh, I mean, it's a bit like sport in that sense, you know, um, in any in any code of football, whichever code it is, you know, you've got to be able to read the play and uh, work out when when it's a good idea to push hard and when it's a good idea to, to back off a little bit and uh, give way to the, the opposition on a particular point because you can trade it off for something else. That That's the whole art of negotiation. And um, I suppose I've had a lot of opportunity to um, to practice that skill, and you know you get you get better at things that you practice. Um, but in any negotiation, there are those opportunities, as I say. How important is it in those circumstances again for you to have that that connection back to the base of the disability community, the disability movement, so that you're almost speaking with one voice. You're not all saying something mm. different. I mean. If, if you were negotiating in that circumstance, I, I would suggest um, around the, the Telstra uh, changes that they wanted to make, um, if everybody had had a different message, it, it would have fallen over. So how yeah. important is it to, to have that common message to try and get on the same page with all the other people you're working with? In the, in the role that I was in as commissioner, it's critical for two reasons. Firstly, because you've got to know and understand the, the nuanced position of the disability field and that and it can be quite nuanced because different people and different organizations uh, on a particular issue can have different uh, views there's usually a spectrum of views there's not one absolute view the other thing that you have to do is consult regularly and broadly enough so that you're trusted by the field because there have been opportunities where i've known i needed to move more quickly than i could um, consult the disability field and because I was trusted by the field I think to a to a reasonable degree not completely and of course the disability field shouldn't trust a person in that position completely but there was a degree of trust because we'd worked together closely on issues I could sometimes advance a position um, being fairly confident that the disability field would when asked uh, you know take the same or a similar line um, so so there's two key reasons why that's that's important Mm, absolutely. Um, who's a leader you admire and why? I think uh, the leader, one of the leaders that I most admire is Julia Gillard. Uh, Julia Gillard will be recognised in the next 10 years as one of Australia's great prime ministers. She's not quite yet. It's starting to happen, but, um, uh, you know, she's not quite there yet. And the, the reason that I say that is um, she never lost a vote on the floor of parliament in all of the time she was Prime Minister, uh, with a minority government that she had, and she maintained absolutely focused on the legislation that she wanted to get through. She wasn't distracted, no matter um, how um, Tony Abbott, and, and Tony Abbott, uh, I think, is one of, the, uh, one of the best leaders of opposition that Australia has, has had. Um, so he was very good at trying to distract the focus and, and, to, and try and stop things happening. Uh, she remained focused and remained determined. And uh, and when you look at some of the things that were achieved by her government, uh, it's a pretty substantial record. So for, for leaders uh, watching this, that ability to focus and not get distracted, to stick to the point, to really keep at it. Would you and, say and they're the, qualities that people yes, think about? Ab absolutely their qualities. No, no question about that. Determination and... Uh, and just continued uh, commitment in the face sometimes of pretty uh, tough opposition and uh, pretty disappointing sets of circumstances. And secondly, uh, all of the things that I've talked about, um, about negotiation uh, apply to good leaders. And the third thing is that you have to be able to take the group that you are leading with you. So you've got to have a real understanding of the, uh, the views, um, of well in this circumstance you know the disability field and uh not not go too fast or um but be prepared to move fast enough when when you think you can but not break that that bond that trust that i talked about uh with the with the group that you are leading and um you know in those sorts of areas leadership is earned it's it it can't be uh, it can't be gifted um you, you have to earn the respect of the people that you are leading and you have to keep earning that respect. And the minute that you forget about that and, and start being taken over by things like entitlement, et cetera, et cetera, that's when your leadership runs into problems. Mm. 
we've run out of time, Graham Innes, but thank you so much for joining the Disability Leadership Institute today to talk leadership. It's great, uh, great to have the opportunity to talk with you, Christina. Thank you. Thanks so much.